speak for health that you're not going to find in any health magazine or any uh, drugstore. Uh, the doctors are not going to talk about this. But we said that we need uh, that trusting God will cause us to have good health. It's good for our health to trust God, to not worry. We talked about that confessing our sins will bring us good health. We also talked about giving generously is good for our health. And then my favorite, having fun is good for our health. And I just trust that God inspired you last week to address your health and your situation, your family. And I'm just going to pray that God continues to challenge you in that area. We offered last week a free assessment. If you just uh, go online, uh, email me, ben at thegatewayGH.com. Uh, you can find me, uh, shoot me an email saying, hey, I'd like to, uh, to have that free assessment looking at some of the critical areas of our lives. Um, and uh, I can forward you the information for that free assessment. Well, today we're going to talk about leaving a, le a lasting legacy, leaving a spiritual legacy. And then next week we'll, we'll wrap up the whole thing, talking about the work that we love, and, uh, and I, you won't want to miss next week. It will be fantastic, I guarantee it. it. God is going to meet us as we wrap up this decade of destiny. When I think about a decade of destiny and I think about leaving a legacy, there's some great companies there's some great individuals that may come to mind. There are great movements that are marked throughout history where, they've, where people and organizations have left a legacy. Maybe some are coming to your mind, like Mother Teresa or you know, Martin Luther King or uh, you know, uh, companies um, that, that have made a difference through the years um, that, that, that give back and... Uh, uh, that are, that are uh, significant. And when I think about leaving a legacy, personally, I want my life to count. I don't want to just drift through life and my life not to mean something, for my life to not have direction. I want to have a plan, like we've been talking about on the early stages of Decade of Destiny. And I want to do the hard work of planning and execute that plan. Not just to have the plan, but to take the steps that it takes to get to where God wants me to be. Some of you would say, well, Pastor, you're driven. You're kind of compelled in that way. Well, I think that all of us uh, need to have that kind of mindset. A few years back, before we moved here to, uh, to the lakeshore, I was out with my son pushing him on the swing. He was about two and a half, three years old. And we're at the park that was in our neighborhood, and I'm pushing him. And there's another dad and, uh, and another kid. He, we're kind of just pushing our kids, just, and we're caught, caught up in this conversation. And this guy, he's telling me, he's like, man, I just wish I could you know, uh, accumulate enough money where I wouldn't have to live uh, or I wouldn't have to work anymore, that I wouldn't have any responsibility, and that I would just, you know, just kind of you know, relax and enjoy life. And I thought, well, and I didn't say anything then, but I thought, boy, what a sad statement. You know, to, to work or to not have to work or not to have responsibility. I know some of you are saying, well, that sounds pretty good. And on the surface, or maybe for a short period of time, that would be okay but ultimately, we want our lives to count. And it takes some effort. It takes some work. It takes some responsibility if we're going to make an impact. And that goes for each and every one of us, students, all the way to the, those that are the oldest among us today. And I just have a word for those that are in the retirement years. You know, you know, some people, they work and work and work so they can retire and relax and, you know, have the little umbrella in their, in their uh, drink and, and uh, enjoy life, right? Well, that's not the goal of our lives. I love what my parents did when they retired. They, they, they talk about, well, we didn't retire. They said, we re-fired. <laughs> and they you were passionate about get what God wanted to do. And maybe just that encouragement will stir the coals in some of your lives and uh, to, to let those flames start to burn again and, uh, that, and just to realize that you are here for a purpose your entire life to your last breath. And what does God have for you? I think if we really were to take a, a poll this morning, we would all want our lives to count. And I don't think anyone would say, no, 
uh, I want my life to stink. <laughs> I, I want my life to not matter. I want my life to, you know, uh, just be average. I don't think any of us would wish that. We want to make an impact. In fact, when I think about our mission and our goal or our vision for the church, our mission is that we are a spirit-filled church, right? Committed to glorifying God by connecting the people of the lakeshore to God with each other and with the world. And we talk about that. And we, it's, it's on our banners and it's on our postcards. And we want to be connecting people with God, with each other, and with the world. But then our, our vision statement is to be a healthy, multiplying church known for making an impact in our community and in our world. And when we think about that, the idea that we are here to make an impact, that challenges us. And I believe that's why so many of you are connecting with us. You're saying, yes, that is what I want. And I want to be a part of something where we are connecting with God, with each other, with the world to make a difference. But how? How do we leave a lasting legacy? Well, there's three things we can do with our lives. One is we can waste our lives with foolish things, parties, you know, having no direction, not learning at school, not applying ourselves. We can waste our lives. The second thing we could do is we could spend our lives. We could get the knowledge. We could understand. We could you know, be wise in some things, but then we could just spend our lives, and uh, it, it could be for ourselves, our busyness, self-absorbed. We live for the here and now. But there's a third thing that I want to challenge you with. Instead of just wasting our lives or just spending our lives, I believe God wants us to invest our lives. And let me uh, help you understand what that means. I believe that the greatest use of your life is to invest it into something that will outlast you. To invest in something that will outlast your life. Every one of us needs to invest our lives into a cause greater than we are individually. We are not here for our own. I want you to imagine that this was a, this was, maybe this is a little morbid, but imagine yourself at your own funeral. If you could, you could slip into the back and you're watching while people are talking about you and uh, you know, giving you know, good things. What would you want people to say about your life? What would, would anyone show up? Have you ever, has anyone ever thought about that? You know, who would come to your funeral? <laughs> I thought about that. But what would they say? And I think that's a good start. It's not complete, and we'll come back to that point. But I think if Jesus was here today, he would encourage us to invest our lives, for our lives to be fruitful and to matter. In fact, there's a great parable that Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the talents. And we won't take the time to read it. You can read it on your own. But there's three individuals that a manager or a, a, a landowner gives three uh, gifts to three different workers. He gives five talents to one, two talents to another, and then one talent to the third. And as you know the story, he leaves and he comes back. And the person that had five, what did he do? He multiplied it, right? And he, how many more did he get? Five more, giving 10 back to the owner. The second person had two, did the same thing, invested, made that money work or made that, those talents work and gave two back. So now instead of two, he had four. But the third one was interesting. He was scared. He didn't live life to the fullest. He didn't understand his purpose, why that he even had the talent in the first place, the Bible says he went and he dug a hole and he buried it and he digs it back up when the, when the owner comes back and he gives him that one talent. And what did the parable say? It says, get away. The other two, he said, well done, good and faithful servant. And I believe that when we stand before the Lord, God is going to ask us, what did you do with your life? And so the question is, how do you have a legacy of investing? Well, the best way to do that is to look at the person who had the greatest legacy of all, Jesus Christ. You think about Jesus and you know, the 33 years that he lived, a short amount of time 
But we are still talking about Jesus today. In fact, God's Word, uh, there's more books written, not only the Bible, there are more Bibles printed and published than any other book in the world. But there's more other books written about Jesus than any other topic. The same thing is true about songs. There are more songs written in this world about Jesus than any other songs. There are more, uh, even though Jesus wasn't an artist himself, there are more pictures painted that reflect something Christ-like than any other type of art. And even the calendar that we use, all of us, today is what? March 27th, 2011, what? A.D., after death. We base our calendar on Jesus Christ. Pretty incredible. That's a legacy. And you say, well, boy, what did Jesus do to have that kind of legacy? Well, <laughs> he died for our sins. He died for the sins of the world like we celebrated this morning in communion. But don't worry, you don't have to do that. In fact, you couldn't do that because you're a sinner just like I am. And none of us could die for the sins of someone else. Only Jesus could. But Jesus did model for us to follow how to live a life that makes a difference. And I want you to turn with me as we look at a life that lasts or a a legacy that lasts more than five years or 50 years or even 500 years. Turn with me to Mark chapter 10. A great, great story, great story here in Scripture. And in, uh, this, this story is also recorded in Matthew chapter 20. And it's interesting that in Matthew chapter 20, um, instead of just James and uh, John uh, coming to Jesus, it actually says that it was the mother of James and John that came and asked the same thing. But let's look at Mark chapter 10 and uh, read this with me. If you don't have a Bible, you can just hop up. We're going to be looking at some scripture this morning. There's some Bibles on the back and uh, follow along with us. But listen to what it says. This is a cool story. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Can you imagine going to Jesus and saying, You know, Jesus, we want you to do whatever we ask because we're that important or that our, you know, our will is, is uh, that important. And then Jesus just lovely, lovingly says, What do you want me to do for you? And they reply, let one of us sit at the right hand and the other at the left in your glory. What are they asking? James and John here are asking about their legacy, what they will be known for, what they will be remembered for. And they're saying, man, we can't imagine anything better than sitting at the left and at the right hand of the Father for eternity. James and John, pretty, something interesting that they're asking for. And Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. He says, can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? And they, they're just zealous. They say, yes, we can. <laughs> Almost like little kids, right? Do whatever I ask. And well, you can't do this. No, we can. <laughs> and Jesus said, you will drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with my baptism. But to sit at my right hand or left hand, I can't grant that. These places belong to those whom they be, have been prepared. And then the disciples overheard. And they're like, man, James and John, those jerks, why are they asking that? And it says, they came and they were indignant with James and John. And so Jesus said, look, come together. Come close, disciples. He gathers the twelve and listen to what he says. He says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentile, they lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. He's saying it's going to be different for you. You're going to lead a different way. And then he says this, whoever instead wants to become great among you, you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. Now, I want you to notice something. We talk about this in Connect 301, our leadership track. Jesus does not say to them, no, you're not to be great. You're not supposed to do great things. But he redefines what greatness is. In that culture, the the government officials, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they would lord it over those that were of a different class. They would make sure that they were known. And then 
He says, no, that's not the way you're going to live. But then verse 45 says this, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served. And then Jesus says something that is so powerful, and it's a very simple true, but I want to look at it this morning. It says here, it says, but Jesus came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus, his legacy was based on the fact that he came to serve and he gave his life to be a, uh, for a legacy. Jesus came to serve, he came to give. And the first one I want to just talk about quickly here is that a life of service will leave a, la- a lasting legacy. As you serve, as you give of yourself, you will leave a lasting legacy. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, says that we were our God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. You could circle that in your Bible. To do means to serve, to do good works, which God created in advance for you to do. And not one of us is exempt from that. You were created to do, to serve. And God has got a plan for your life, and we've been talking about that. And God wants you to fulfill that plan. He wants you to go after what his heart is. Not serving yourself, but serving others. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, a great verse talking about Jesus and his example. You can turn with me there uh, quickly. Uh, Just a couple of verses over from there. Talking about Jesus and imitating his humility. It says in verse 6, um, or in verse 5, your attitude should be the same of Christ Jesus, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But verse 7 says, but he made himself taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even to the cross. Jesus gave of himself. He served unselfishly. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 10, a great verse uh, uh, encouraging the the people of Israel. Uh, Chapter 10, verse 12 says this, and now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? You can put your name in that. Now, Ben Ve, what is God asking of me? What is it God asking of you? But to fear the Lord your God, walk in his ways, to love him, and then circle this, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. God wants us to be serving him, to be giving of our lives. But you know, the choice is ours. No one's going to force you to do that. In fact, in Joshua chapter 24, verse 14 Again, it says here, it says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with faithfulness, right? Throw away the gods of your forefathers' worship beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Joshua is encouraging. He's uh, writing, uh, renewing the covenant with God for the people. He says, Look, serve the Lord. And then verse 15 says, But if serving the Lord does not appeal to you, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, Then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me, Joshua said, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. I think I said this before. My dad, when he got married, that was a verse that he uh, uh, included in the marriage vows. He says, look, as for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. And I, I think I told you this before. Uh, when I got married, I, I wanted to say the same thing. And I had it all planned out. And we did this little presentation for Jessica's parents and, and then my parents. And then I was supposed to stand up and say, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Off this verse. And I totally forgot. <laughs> so I stand here today. Let me just say, as for me and my household, with God's help, We will serve the Lord. Amen? And you only serve by giving your life away. 
We were created to serve God. And as we do, we will create a legacy that will outlive ourselves as we give ourselves away. This morning, we have a guest, some guests with us that model this idea of giving their lives away, serving the Lord with their lives. Pierce and Megan Davis are missionaries to Nicaragua. They've been married only for about a year and a half, but God has impressed on their heart to leave the creature comforts of the Detroit area, good jobs, friends, and family, to go reach the people in Nicaragua. They're serving the Lord with their lives, giving it all away. And I'll tell you, we highlight missions here at the Gateway Church. We believe that missionaries are heroes, don't we? And so this morning, I want you to honor Pierce and Megan Davis. Let's give them a warm welcome as he comes and challenges us with this idea of serving God with everything within us. Amen? Amen. Let's give them a hand, all right? Yeah. Come on, let's give them a royal gateway welcome. Yeah. They're heroes, aren't they? Woo! Yeah! Woo! Yeah! We love fishing. All right, it's all yours, my friend. You guys are going to make me cry. <laughs> All right. Uh, no, we want to thank you guys. We want to thank Pastor Ben and Pastor Mark just for the hospitality that they've shown us, and, and just for you guys being so friendly. We got to meet with the, or I got to meet with the missions convention or committee this week, and you guys just have an awesome, awesome leadership that really just cares and loves you guys. Um, this is my wife Megan. She is deathly afraid of talking, so she's going to step down so I can do it. <laughs> uh, we are going to Nicaragua. We have been married for about a year and a half. About four months after we got married, God opened up a door and just gave us a call. And uh, so we said we were going, and, and we love the country of Nicaragua. We just got back from there a few weeks ago. Um, it, it's a country where 80% of the population lives in poverty, um, and, and it's just it's full of corruption, crime, drugs, and alcohol. And, and the, the people who really suffer in this culture, in this country, are the children. Um, the parents are distant. Most of the kids are orphaned. They'll sell the kids into prostitution or something like that. It's just a really unfortunate situation. Um, even this morning, there were thousands of kids who woke up in the local dumps of Nicaragua who live only off the resources that they can find, whether it's food that they can eat in the garbage or bottles to return to buy a meal. Um, but, but God has been so, so awesome in that country, and we've actually been able to work with a feeding center right outside the dump that uh, feeds over a thousand kids every week. And, and it's just an awesome, awesome opportunity for us to minister to these kids and show them a God that loves them. And I remember when we landed and uh, we, we went straight to the dump and as soon as we got out of the car, you see hundreds of kids just running up to you wanting to be held and hugged because they don't have parents, they don't have anyone to love them. And uh, so it's, it's just awesome to, to see these children that are, that are just, um, they're sought after God, and, and they're just sought after love. And in, in all reality, they just want to be loved. Uh, I remember when we got off the, got out of the van. There was this kid that walked up, and his name was Samuel, and he had these tattoos on his hand, and tattoos on his legs. And uh, I tried to talk to him, and he wouldn't really say much. He's really kind of cold and distant and stuff. And uh, so we went through the feeding center, uh, went throughout the day, started feeding all the kids and stuff like that. But after the feeding center, Samuel came back up to us, and he started crying. He started bawling his eyes out. And uh, so I get a translator, and uh, we start talking to him. And what had happened was a few days prior to this, he was walking down the streets of uh, his neighborhood um, around the dumps, and a local gang came and grabbed him, and they pinned him down on the ground, and they took out a knife, and they started carving into his skin. And so the tattoo that I saw on his hand was really a scar from where someone had held him down and, and really just uh, carved their gang symbol into his hand. And on his legs, they tied the... Uh, they tagged his mom's initials on one leg and his dad's initials on the other leg. And what that represented was that if Samuel ever wanted to retaliate or, or go tell the authority, if the police even cared, that they would go after and they would kill his mom and dad. So it was a constant reminder that, that he couldn't escape his neighborhood, that he couldn't, he couldn't leave to join another gang or anything like that, but that he was their property. 
But the cool part about that is, is one of the first places he came to was to our feeding center, not to get food. Samuel didn't even eat the day that we did the feeding center. He came to be prayed over and to hear about a God who loved them because there were people there who, who, who invested their lives in, into kids like Samuel. And the cool part about our feeding center, uh, Pastor Ben was saying, you know, once you hit that retirement age, it doesn't end there. The people who started our feeding center were, the, um, were 60 years old when they went out. They had retired from their jobs in America and felt God calling them to Nicaragua, and they spent all of their retirement funds on building this feeding center right outside the dumps of Nicaragua. And if it wasn't for people like that, Megan and I wouldn't even be able to go there and work with couples like John and Wilma who have sacrificed so much and who don't plan on retiring in Florida or anything like that, but plan on staying in Nicaragua until they die because that's their passion. That's what God has called them to do. Um, you know, I, I honestly believe that we're all called to be missionaries. I told this to our youth group. Uh, we always hear the, the phrase, well, you know, some are called to go, some are called to send, some are, are called to pray and give. I, I think there's like, it's like the test, you know, it's like uh, question D or answer D, all of the above. That's what I feel like our life is. Um, and not to brag, but Megan and I have given more to mission since we became missionaries than we ever did before because we understand the importance and the value of what money can do through with children in Nicaragua or Africa or India. So I honestly believe that we're all to play a role in this thing called missions and the Great Commission. Um, some of you guys might be called to go to India or, or somewhere or maybe even Bangladesh. In Bangladesh right now, um, their core values in the Assemblies of God, they have the, this set of core values, the 16 fundamental truths. They added a 17th one this year that said, you will suffer for my name. And that's in their constitutional, uh, their core doctrine of saying that if you're gonna be a Christian in Bangladesh, you will suffer, you will face persecution. And, and they're investing their lives, they're giving everything they have to be a part of the Great Commission. And, and some of you guys, you know, a lot of us, we're not going to be called to go overseas, you know, but, and, but God, our mission field is right here. Your mission field is here in Spring Lake, Michigan. Our mission field until we land in Nicaragua is the Detroit area, and we're going around to churches, and we're trying to encourage kids and, and, and open up people's eyes to, to a God that loves them in the best way that we can. You know, I came from a home where drugs and alcohol and violence and everything, like, we were abused as kids. My parents got divorced. I remember going home when I was 15 years old, and, and my mom and stepdad at that time were wanted by the cops, and they left, and no one told me. And, but God had a purpose for me. God had a plan for me, and if it wasn't for that, I don't think I would be able to, to have things in common with kids in Nicaragua who have experienced the same thing. And so I just want to encourage you guys. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily believe that the only way you can witness to people at your work or, or anywhere is to stand on, like, the coffee table and just start yelling that Jesus loves them, you know. I, I believe in a relevant way of sharing, of sharing your story, of sharing your testimony. One of the greatest examples I've ever had of witnessing to someone was when I was at a golf course last, last year, and I love golf, and I just went out to golf by myself just to practice and stuff like that. And I go to my golf cart, and there's this 70, 66-year-old guy next to me, and he's like, hey, my partner left. Do you want to golf with me? And I'm like, okay, you know, I didn't know him or nothing. So we get in the cart, and we start our introductions, and he tells me his name, and I say, I'm Pierce, I'm a missionary, and he's like, well, this is going to be interesting. I'm like, how so? And he's like, a religious man golfing with an atheist. And, <laughs> and so I looked at him, and I'm like, hey, that's what God invented golf for, you know, joking around. <laughs> but did you know for the next two and a half hours, he started asking me questions about missions, about God. He told me his whole testimony about how he had been through two divorces, how he felt that he was not loved or wanted. Like, this 66-year-old man, like, I could never have anything with com in common with him, I thought. But we spent two and a half hours talking about a God that loves him. And it was all because I was just open to share my faith and to share my testimony. I told him where I had been from and stuff like that. And, and it was just one of the greatest examples I've ever had of witnessing to someone. And so we just want to thank you guys for being a mission sending church. You know, we were walking out in the hallways earlier, and we know so many of the missionaries that you guys support. And Pastor Ben was telling me when he first came here, you guys supported six missionaries, and now you're at over 20. And that's amazing that you guys are being so faithful into what God has given you. And, and we just want to encourage you, and I just want to leave you with a quote um, uh, by John Ogden. And, it, and he just talks about how the human church does not exist to celebrate the memory of a great man. But instead, we come together fused as a living organism to show the power of that great man. And so I just want to leave you guys today, like, go into your workplaces, share what God's done in your life, and, and continue supporting missions. You know, go on a trip, give. All of the above is what we're called to be and what we're called to do. And so I just want to thank you guys for this opportunity. And, and we want you to know that, that we love this church, that, 
we love the standing ovation. I'm serious. I was almost in tears. That was <laughs> that was awesome to see, and, and we're just proud to, to partner with churches like the Gateway Church, so we just want to thank you guys. Awesome. Very good, Pierce. And we say thank you, and they're going to head back and talk with the kids. They'll be back at the end of the service, and we'll have an opportunity to give uh, to them. And what an example of serving, of giving their lives. And I, I tell you, it challenges me uh, to serve in that kind of way. Because what Pierce and what, uh, what Megan are doing will leave a legacy that outlives them. And you have the same potential as we do some of the things that Pierce was talking about. So the first one was a life of service will leave a lasting legacy. Mark 10, where we, where we were looking, said that Jesus came to serve, and then it says, and to give. And the second point I want us to look at this morning is that a life of generosity will leave a lasting legacy. In Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 10, in the Message Bible, it says this. It says, give freely and spontaneously. Don't have a stingy heart. It says that the way that you handle matters like this, in in other words, talking about generosity, the way that you handle matters like this triggers God's blessings in everything you do and in all your work and in all your ventures. As your pastor, I want your life to be blessed. I want your family to be blessed. I want your career to be blessed. I want your kids to be blessed. I want your friendships to be blessed. I want your finances and health to be blessed. I want our church to be blessed. I want our nation to be blessed. And it's all tied to generosity. It triggers God's blessings in your life. How many have ever heard that you can give without loving, but you cannot love without without giving. I heard that this week and was reminded of that. And I thought, man, that is so true. The more I am generous, the more I am blessed. And some people take this to an extreme and it's dangerous. And I, I think it's a, a bad uh, way to look at Scripture. They, they say, well, I'm going to give so I can get. And that's not what we're talking about. We give so we can be a blessing. And one of my favorite uh, sections of Scripture that talks about giving is 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And I want to encourage everyone to turn there with me. We're going to look at these few verses and pull out some truths here, and then we'll be finished and uh, and, uh, give God the glory. It says this in chapter 9, verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly, under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Amen? And God is able to do, or God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things and at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Verse 10. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest, I love that, of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can give generous on every occasion. And through your generosity, you, or, and, through, and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. The first thing I want to pull out is looking at verse 6. It says, remember this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. The first thing I want you to know is that each of us must say, I must see my giving as an investment, not as an expense. Generosity in God's word is always tied to a sowing seed mentality. A harvest principle. Jessica and I, we got a a good taste of this this last year. First time ever. It was mostly Jessica. We created a little garden in our backyard. A little square foot garden. And some of you guys have seen it. It's kind of cool. But you know what? We learned some lessons from that right from God's word. The first thing is you will reap what you sow. As we were putting little green bean, little seeds, or uh, marigolds, and tomatoes, and who knows what else, squash, and 
all these kinds of things. In those little boxes, that's what came up. It's amazing. (laughs) But we also saw that you get more than you put in. We put a couple seeds. They would sprout. We'd choose the strongest. We'd clip the others. And that that one seed would produce a crop greater than itself. No, no farmer in the world looks at sowing seed as an expense. Do you get that? A farmer says, man, I'm going to sow as much as I can, as much as my property could hold. I'm going to sow because we know that it's an investment, not an expense. The last thing we, we realize is that you reap in a different season. We've planted and we waited <laughs> And we watered and we looked. Nothing happened. And we're like, what in the world? And then even after the sp- it sprouts a little bit, our harvest didn't come for some time later. And you know, as I thought about that principle this week, and I looked back at our lives, and Jessica, we haven't even talked about this, but different things that we have sowed over the years. I believe there are things that we have sowed that we haven't reaped the benefit yet. And I believe God wants, we will reap in a different season. And that's a, I want that to be an encouragement to you like it was to me. It's a test of faith. And in the decade of destiny, in this next 10 years, I want to just ask, how big of a harvest do you want? The second thing we see in verse number two, or uh, verse seven, the second thing is that I must never give out of pressure or guilt. That actually stops the blessing of God. Look at verse 7. It says, Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. This is so huge. No one should ever force you to give. If you ever feel that from me, if you feel pressure, don't give. It's what God does in your heart that you should be responsible for. But if God puts something on your heart, take it by faith and give. And we know that as we give, God brings it back over and over. There's two ways you can give. You can give by reason. You can kind of open up your checkbook and say, all right, we've got this much, so I can give this much. And that's okay to a certain extent. But I believe that God wants us to give by revelation, that we seek the Lord. What it says here, look at that. It says, not reluctantly, or each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give. Do you believe that God could put it inside your spirit, what he desires you to give? I do. And so we ask God, God, what is it that you want me to give in any circumstance of life? And you need to be responsible for that and that alone. This is great. This week, I was I was preparing for this, and, and uh, I was thinking, you know, I was, I was thinking early in the week, I was like, you know, I'm going to tell the folks, if someone comes to your door, all right, and, uh, and says, you know, uh, you know, we've got this, you know, card we want you to buy, we're going to Florida uh, for some trip or whatever, uh, you know, can you help support? And uh, if you don't feel compelled to do so, tell them your pat, slam the door, what? no, don't slam the door. Lovingly, just tell them, you know, my pastor said, I don't have to do it. (laughs) And it just gets you, it's the get off free card. But if God puts it on your heart, don't be stingy, all right? But what happened just yesterday, these uh, students from Grand Haven, they showed up and they're they're raising money to go to Florida. And uh, it was so crazy. And uh, and I was already been thinking I was going to say something like that this week. And, uh, And I I'm not going to tell you what I did, but just to, for you, for you, you know that you can say, hey, my pastor said uh, I don't have to give, <laughs> and uh, let that be revelation to you. All right, okay, verse 8, verse 8 says this, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things and at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. The third thing we can take to the bank is this, I can expect God will meet my needs. What's the word over and over in that little verse? All, in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every, in all good works. 
How badly do you want God to bless your life? It's connected to being generous, trusting God as an investment in your life. And you can expect that God will meet your needs. Number four, we got just two more, is I can expect God to multiply the seed. Now I kind of feel like a TV evangelist. How many have ever turned on the TV and they're like, sow seed, sow seed, sow seed. But it is so true because God's word says, it says, now he that supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. It's a, it's a biblical principle. You can take it to the bank. The word there, to increase or to, to enlarge, means to increase and to enlarge. And it's so important. And you know, I was reflecting on God's word in the New Testament five times It it records the statement that we are to store up treasures in heaven instead of here on earth. And it speaks to an investment into the kingdom of God. And God wants you to do that. And we can expect that God will multiply the seed. If you're saying, man, I can only give a dollar. How many believe God can do more with that dollar than he can with hundreds? I believe that. God will multiply the seed and he brings it back to you in the same way. And I think about our lives. You know, our lives are so short in, in light of eternity. If we can invest for our forever, how much better are we going to be off in heaven? And I know it's hard to think that way. It's hard to think beyond this life. But the, the, the promise is true that we will live forever and we can invest in this life and it will come back to us in the life to come in heaven. The fifth one, as I close. I can expect to be able to give more than I thought. Verse 11 says this, You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your, and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. There's a principle I like to talk about that God wants us to be like a straw or a, a funnel that if he can get the money to us or the resources to us, that he could get it through us. And that goes for us as a church, and it goes for us individually. Now listen, God does not bless me so I can be greedy. He doesn't bless you so you can be greedy. He doesn't bless me so I, uh, God blesses me instead so I can be more generous, generous on every occasion. And so we give to God in faith. And I would just challenge you as I challenge myself to ask God to bless your life so that you can give. And it often starts with a seed. It starts with something small that God takes and he multiplies. So this morning as we wrap up our service, I want us in the worship team, you can come, Melissa, you can come. I want us to take a look on the inside. What are you investing in? What legacy are you expecting from God? And we could take this model that Jesus gave, that a life of service, a life of generosity, will lead to a lasting legacy. And my heart is is that it would challenge you like it's challenging me. Let's consider what our life is worth. What really matters? What really counts? I want to take you back to that moment where you might have thought about being at your own funeral. And at the beginning, I said that, you know, there's some value in thinking about what will other people say about your life. But you know what? Ultimately, it doesn't matter what other people say about my life. The only thing that really matters is what God sees. And so instead of investing in our own security or investing in our own lives, would God challenge us individually and as a body to invest in his kingdom? There's no greater cause than the kingdom of God. 
And in light of that, we are called to serve and we are called to give. You say, why? <laughs> well, first of all, when you do, it makes you feel good. How many of you have ever been on a missions trip? Just you know, give me a, a little hand. All right. A bunch of us, maybe 20% or more, 30%. How many of you have ever served at a local food bank or served giving out clothes uh, you know, to those that are needy? Yeah, it feels good, doesn't it? Our students just yesterday spent some time at uh, a local uh, senior home giving of themselves. And the report, for those that participated, they enjoyed it. There's something about that that puts a smile on your face. It feels good. It also makes a difference when you give. When we show up at the Gleaner's trucks like we did a couple weeks ago, and we gave out 10,000 pounds of food, our church supplied for our community, it makes a difference for those families that are there. This last Friday, they gave another food truck out. And this is no lie. On my way home from our meeting, uh, from our um, board meeting on Thursday night, I passed the parking lot where they give out all this food every other week. At 11 o'clock at night, there were cars in the parking lot with their buggies in a line that was starting at 11 o'clock the night before to get food. The need is huge. It makes a difference when we decide to serve, when we get outside. When we serve and when we give, it changes the destiny of those around us. It changes our destiny. And I just want to challenge us as a body of believers that in the next 10 years, as your pastor, I am going to encourage you to serve more. We've talked about recently this idea that someone ought to do something about that. And there's going to be things that will bubble up inside your heart. And I'm going to ask that you would serve and that you would lead initiatives and lead ministries to make an impact. In the next 10 years, I'm going to ask that you would give more. And I'm going to pray that God would stretch us and that you would be able, like verse 10 or verse 11, Verse 10, that we would be able to give generously on every occasion. Why? Because the reality is that our world is full of spiritual emptiness, self-serving leadership, extreme poverty, pandemic disease, drugs, drug wars, illiteracy. And those are some global big problems that I believe that the body of Christ has a chance to participate in. But there are also some needs in marriages. There are hurting people right in our community, lost people without hope. And the same is true, that God is going to put those people in our hearts. Our message is to serve and to give just like Jesus did. Amen? And I want to lead the way. I'm not going to ask you to do something I'm not willing to do. Our mission, our vision statement speaks to making an impact in our community and in our world. And together, I believe that we have got an incredible opportunity, a credible, an incredible challenge ahead of us. But it takes all of us serving and giving. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. The first thing I want us to consider is our own life. If you have found yourself here at the Gateway Church this morning, and you realize you are away from God, that, you're, that if you were to die today, you're not sure where you'd spend an eternity, that's the first step before you do anything else, to give your heart to the Lord, surrender to Him. Just as you look inside, maybe you were able to take communion, but boy, you're wondering, if you have any doubt at all, don't leave here with doubt. Let God give you assurance. If you're here, and that's you, and you need to get your heart right with the Lord, would you just slip up your hand, and I want to pray for you. Is there anyone this morning? I say, yep, that's me. I'm away from God this morning. Yeah. 
one hand in the back. Anyone else? Yeah, thanks for being honest. A couple young men this morning. Anyone else? Saying, that's me. Pray for me. I know these young men that raise their hands. I'm not going to embarrass them. But you know, if there's something healthy about saying, you know what? I want to get my heart right with the Lord. And could we encourage these two? Just, uh, I want to lead you in a prayer. And would you say this prayer with me? And maybe you didn't have the, the guts to raise your hand. But if it's not the words of this prayer that make a difference. It's believing them in your heart. So would you say these words after me? And believe them. Let's say it together. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, please forgive me. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I believe in you. I believe you died on the cross and that you rose again. Save me today. Forgive me today. And I will serve and I will give. In Jesus' name. I want everyone's eyes on me as we close. We're going to close by receiving an offering as you leave. And in that offering, I want to challenge you before you leave. There's offering envelopes right where you are. I want to challenge you to be generous. Pierce and Megan, they need our help. And there are offering envelopes right there. You can grab a pen, fill fill out a check, or uh, put some money in. Let's bless them. Let's let them leave the Gateway Church knowing that that we're behind them. And we want to do that. And as you leave, we'll do that. The second thing, though, is we want to open up the altars that we could pray with you. And Pierce and Megan, they're going to pray. Jessica and I, we will stay. We want to pray with those of you that are serious about leaving a legacy beyond yourself. In prayer this last Wednesday night, the speaker that that we were listening to before we prayed talked about bringing people to this point in a service and then just letting people go. He says, man, we got to let, at that moment, we got to give them an opportunity to solidify some some of the things God's doing in their hearts. And that really resonated with me. And so as Melissa will lead, she'll she'll play. Would you come? Would you spend some time? We want to pray with you and ask God to just put it in your heart to serve, to give like you never have before. And some of you, I know, you're resistant to come forward, but there's something about stepping out And I'm going to just appeal to students, to parents, young adults, older adults. Would you spend a moment before you leave, before you even give, and spend some time with the Father and do just that. Just commit your ways to the Lord. I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes. I'm going to pray, and that will be a concluding prayer. But at that time, The altars will be open. The ushers will be at the back to receive your offering. And I just want to challenge you. You haven't worshiped fully till you give. And so we want to encourage you to do that. But let's pray. Lord, we just ask that in this next moment or two, as we reflect on your word, reflect on your mission, that you came not to be served, but to serve and to give your life as a ransom for many. Lord, I pray that you just fill our hearts with anticipation for these next 10 years of our lives, for the next season of our lives, that they would be be most fruitful. And Lord, I pray that we would not just hurry up and, and go, but Lord, we would spend some time reflecting on what you have for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Lord, like I often pray, I pray that you'd go before us, behind us, and all around us. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. I'm going to ask that we bring the lights down. And this place is now a place of worship. Pierce and Meg, I want you guys to come. And we're going to pray. Jessica, come with. And we will pray. And if you need to slip out, feel free to go. Go in the grace of God. The ushers will be at the back door here. So as you leave, make sure you give. And let's just 
commit our ways to the Lord together this morning. Amen.